Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of what we now uh, call the Unisoft question, my YouTube show, uh, where I interview really interesting lawyers for the most part about their work. And today I have a good friend and a wonderful lawyer, litigator here with me. His name is Ren Buchholz. He's right here. Hello, Ren. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Hi, Pulat. Great to see you. Very good to see you. Can you tell us very, very briefly what you're all about? And then we'll just go quickly through your career path to see how you landed where you are right now. Uh, sure, happy to. Uh, so my name is, is Ren. I'm a partner at the law firm Pallier Roland, uh, where I practice civil litigation. Um, and civil litigation is, is, of course, a very broad term, uh, which is really what brought me to it. Uh, I like the variety of things that we get to do. And that can be anything from, um, you know, corporate commercial litigation to intellectual property, defamation, class actions, um, big files, small files. Uh, there's just a whole lot of stuff that we get to do as civil litigators. And um, that's, that's how I spend my days. You're originally from Chicago, are, are you not? That is correct. Yeah, no, I was, I was born in, well, in Chicago Heights, which is sort of like the 905 of Chicago. Um, is and, Obama uh, from there too? You know, I'm not sure where, if, he, um, if he has any connection to Chicago Heights, uh, but he, I mean, he is from Chicago, uh, as far as I know. Yeah. And um, we, yeah, but I, I bounced around a bunch in the States before coming to Canada in 2005. You did uh, your undergrad uh, in Colorado, and you did it in journalism, if I'm not mistaken. So you were a young guy. Why did you go into a journalism program? Oh, gosh, that's a, you're taking me back there, Pulat. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, I, the way that I got involved in journalism um, was because, so I, I was always interested in, in new technologies and the intersection of new technologies and the law. Um, in, um, in high school, I, you know, was it, I, I started a high school radio station in university. I, was, I managed the, um, the, the local community radio station. And that was at a time in the United States where there was a, a great deal of, of consolidation in the media. So uh, there were there basically the Telecommunications Act of 1996 had changed how concentrated ownership could be, and so uh, that had kicked off a whole bunch of changes in the you know in the ownership of newspapers, the ownership of radio stations, and um, and that of course was happening at the same time that the internet was becoming uh, front and center in many people's lives and. I found that all super fascinating, you know, from a from a cultural perspective, from a music perspective, from a you know uh, in, from an intellectual um, structural perspective, and so I was lucky enough to be in a in a journalism program that had multiple streams, you know, uh, broadcast journalism, photojournalism, and also media studies, which is uh, what I was in, and um, that was. Uh, a degree that was that was that revolved around studying media institutions, how they develop, uh, how they interact with one another, and how they're regulated. Interesting. How did you end up in Canada? Uh, that, <laughs> it was sort of the classic uh, uh, situation where a job and a girl brought me here. Um, my my wife uh, is Canadian, and she was doing her uh, her doctorate. Uh, in California when we met. And um, when she finished that degree, she got a teaching post here in Canada. And, um, and I was working for an NGO. I, I worked for about five, six years before law school uh, for an organization called the Electronic Frontier Foundation that does um, technology and civil liberties work. And so uh, my, my job at that time took me to Europe quite a lot. And also I, I, we had an interest in promoting a copyright reform uh, process that was going on in Canada at the time. So when I moved here in 2005, I uh, continued to lobby on um, copyright policy issues here. And then I spent probably a week a month uh, in Europe dealing with, um, in, in some cases, I, most of the time I was in Geneva doing treaty negotiation stuff around intellectual property issues. And I also uh, worked on broadcast um, standards. So uh, broadcast standards as they related to digital broadcasting 
in um, in a variety of locations in in uh, Europe. So anyway, I could do that easier. I was it was easier to fly to Europe from Toronto than it was from San Francisco, and uh, and plus my wife was here, so that was exciting. Right. So you moved to Canada in two thousand and five, about the year after you graduated from university in Colorado. And you didn't waste any time. You entered a master's program at York in communication and culture. I can see how communication and culture ties into your interest in policy and technology. Uh, and in general, uh, this shift that society was undergoing at the time. But I totally didn't know that you were in that program at the same time as you were in law school, which you started in 2007. I, I had no idea you were in two programs at the same time. How did that work out? Um, it, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's one of those things where um, when people would find out that I was in these two programs, they would say, wow, that's that's um, that doesn't seem like a good idea. And I was like, you know, it probably isn't because it's a lot of work, both the law school and uh, and the master's program. I, by the time I got to law school, I was really kind of at the tail end of my thesis writing, and um, and was you know was working on um, my degree, which was basically looking at competition law and standards organizations and the the interaction of those things. Um, but you know, when I got to Canada, I was uh, I had been um, thinking about you know, do I want to do academia? Do I want to go into private practice? And become a lawyer, and this was a way for me to sort of figure that out on the on um, in a hands-on kind of way, and um, and it was great because I, I was able to you know do the masters and you know have a sense of what that would be like, and I was also watching my 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 partner uh, you know start her her career as an academic, and um, and I realized that being an academic is much harder than being a litigator. And, uh, and that as, as um, fantastic as it is to be an academic, I was, I was looking for something that was a, a, a little bit, um, uh, yeah, a little bit different. And, and litigation uh, really uh, jumped out at me as a, as a place where I, I could continue to wrestle with you know, difficult, uh, intellectually meaty questions um, while also, um, you know, dipping into lots of different subject areas, and um, and that's yeah, that was that was sort of the the, the basis under which I, I sort of headed in the direction of litigation. While at Osgood, you summered at uh, Lansner Slat, mm -hmm. and I think it was your second summer, correct? That's right. My first my first summer, I went back to California and I did a, a Google Policy Fellowship. So basically, did a um, uh, a few months in um, in San Francisco, studying some of these these um, competition law issues that I was that I've been working on in my thesis, and uh, yeah, in my second year summer, I, I went to Lensner Slat and um, had a great summer, and we we <laughs> we had just had our first child at that point, so I started you know at uh, at Lensner's with um, I think we had a, a four month old at the time, um, and so that was also a <laughs> A whole, a whole, uh, a whole lot, but um, a really great experience. I remember when your first child was born. You brought him to our senior editor meetings at the Law Journal at Osgood. <laughs> so when you said that, uh, that uh, he's twelve now, right? So yeah, he's almost twelve. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's been, been a, bit. a long time. Yeah. Well, you ended up uh, at Lensner's for your second summer. Uh, I guess by that point, there was no doubt that you wanted to be a litigator, correct? That's right. Yeah. But when did you know that you wanted to be a litigator? Well, I, I think it, it's, a, it's a good question because I think that um, there were sort of two components to this. One is trying to figure out as a, you know, I was in my mid twenties at that point, um, trying to figure out what was exciting to me and uh, by way of a profession, you know, I was sitting here thinking, okay, I'm out of university. I've done some graduate work. I've, um, I've worked for a few years now. Uh, in many cases during school, um, but I had, you know, started to develop a sense of what, you know, uh, um, what got me excited about going to work, you know, what got me excited about um, how I spend my days. And the things that really, uh, I think, crystallized for me in that time were that, you know, I like variety. I like being able to, to learn about different areas of, um, of the world 
figuring out how it works. You know, how does power work? How do people navigate those power structures? Um, you know, these are things that just were questions that kept on arising and had been arising, uh, I realized, in my work in school up until that point. Um, I also recognize that I, you know, I like working on teams of people who, who are smarter than me. You know, there's no way, there's no better way to tackle those kinds of problems or, or investigate those issues than with a group of folks that you, um, you know, that you respect and who's, uh, uh, you know, whose approach to these topics is, you know, is rigorous and interesting and, you know, ethical and all the rest of it. And, um, and, and I think I also, you know, the thing that, that, that definitely clicked for me in this period when I was kind of, I was doing graduate school, I was doing this treaty stuff in Europe, and then I was in law school. Um, one thing that was really apparent um, from my work in Europe was that, um, I needed something that had more immediacy when it comes to um, the effects of my actions. So when I was in Geneva working on treaty stuff, you know, even if we had you know a, a phenomenal um, success, you know, in, in in crafting language that was going to go into a recommendation, we were realistically looking at a, a situation where the um, you know that language might make it into a draft treaty that draft treaty might make it to um, passage through the um, the specialized agency of the UN where I was working. Uh, and then at some point in the future, various countries would ratify the treaty and then implement it through local law. That process takes um, five, 10, 15 years, you know, for, for most contentious issues. And it's important work and it's important that that we work in that sphere. But for me, it, you know, I, I was looking at that thinking, you know, I would like to be able to see the, um, the impact of my efforts more quickly. And, uh, and so that was, you know, that was kind of the last of the three components that made me really um, latch on to litigation as a, uh, you know, as, as a way forward. Uh, because I get to, again, I get to work on all kinds of different matters. Um, I get to dip into different parts of society and the economy and um, you know, areas of business, areas of, of regulation that are, that are um, very disparate. And I, I get to do that with teams of people, uh, which are also changing, but teams of people who I really enjoy working with, um, you know, who, who, are, who, who, who come at this with a level of, um, you know, intellectual curiosity that's, that's really terrific and invigorating. And I quite like it. So you looked at influencing legislators and you looked at influencing judges and you chose influencing judges because you can do that faster and uh, sooner than uh, through lobbying or influencing policy. Is this a, a more or less accurate take? Yeah, I, I guess, and, and maybe, I guess I didn't really think about it as the judges themselves. You know, I, like I, I wasn't sort of, I wasn't looking at this thinking, I, I'm looking forward to convincing people that I'm right. I, I, I was looking at it more like, you know, when you, have an, a, when you have a problem or your client in this case, you know, in the case of a litigator has a problem, you know, is there a, is there a route to um, solving that problem? And is it one that you can kind of wrap your arms around and, you know, and, and make a difference for those, uh, the, the people that you work with uh, in terms of your clients. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I would say that I would make that just that slight distinction because in many cases, the work that we do doesn't, you know, the, doesn't actually go before a judge. You know, there's the, there's the specter of, a, of an adjudicated outcome at the end of a very long road. But as you know, you know, most, the vast majority of claims that are filed don't ever get to trial. And increasingly, you know, what we do is, um, you know, we're helping people, organizations, institutions, uh, you know, navigate the pre-conflict stage so that, you know, they can, they can avoid um, the expense and uh, um, uncertainty of an adjudicated outcome. I have a, uh question about the practical aspect of what you just said from the point of view of a litigator. So you just said that you help clients navigate the pre-conflict stage. Uh, how do you structure 
your role in this process to avoid becoming a witness if uh, the uh, situation evolves into actual litigation? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I mean, for, for my practice is, um, I think not too uncommon, which is that whenever we have an engagement uh, with a client, it's pursuant to the terms of a written engagement letter. So there's a, you know, it, it's clear from the outset that we are acting in a, in a, in a solicitor client relationship. And um, that allows us to give, um, you know, candid advice uh, that is meant to allow our clients to navigate these, these, these difficult situations. And so, you know, it, it's possible, obviously, for lawyers to um, uh, get too deep into the fray and therefore become witnesses. But we're, we're constantly, I think, aware of um, the need to maintain, you know, critical distance from the facts that we're, that, uh, that, that are developing in some cases. Um, and, and also, you know, advising your clients about that, you know, let, letting them know that, you know, that there are ways in which the solicitor client relationship can be um, uh, affected by, you know, the actions of a lawyer or the actions of a client and, and that in order to maintain the, um, the, this kind of zone of protection for the advice that I give, you know, that's, that's, that, that is a concern that we, you know, will surface with clients when appropriate. So you talked about the essence of your work being about solving difficult problems for clients using potentially the specter of adjudication by assembling highly competent, highly intelligent teams. Do you find that there are some similarities between this approach, apart from using the specter of adjudication, of course, uh, some similarities between this approach and how technology companies um, do business? And isn't this also why you were drawn into this industry? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, you're right. There's no, um, the, the idea of assembling, you know, a team of, of competent individuals to tackle a problem is, you know, that, that's not unique to litigation or, or even to technology, but, but there are some, you know, um, so, some interesting parallels there where you, you know, in a, in a technological context or in a startup context, there are pretty, you know, clearly defined roles that you need to fill. You know, there are, there are technical needs for a project in that world where, you know, uh, it, it, you, you can have 10 smart people, but you need the one who can code in Python, you know, to do this, <laughs> to do this particular task, or you, you have 10 parts smart people, but you need um, somebody with project management chops to be able to, you know, bring the project to the finish line. Um, and I should say that, you know, part of my thinking around this comes from uh, the fact that I was, I lived in San Francisco during the kind of first dot-com bubble and bust. And, um, and a lot of my work now is, is in the technology sphere. Um, in law, I think that there's, you know, maybe some of the roles or, or the skill sets aren't as, as crisply delineated, you know, like we, we tend to, um, as litigators at, I mean, certainly at Lentzner's and, and as, absolutely at Pallier Roland where, you know, where I've been for the last five years or so, we, um, we, we select for generalists. You know, we, we select for people who are able to um, roll with the punches in different um, kinds of advocacy environments. Um, and so in some ways, you know, we, you know, because we, we really try to build you know, generalist capabilities, um, we, we're, we're not as kind of tied to, you know, a, a person being, you know, really, really good at a particular issue because we think of ourselves as advocates first, as opposed to specialists in a, in a particular subject matter. You just mentioned some aspects of uh, a profile of a lawyer at firms like Lenzner's or Pallier Roland. So high intelligence, uh, being a generalist who is able to roll with the punches, can you talk about some other aspects of the general profile or is there even such a thing as a general profile of a lawyer uh, at one of these, I would say elite firms? 
Yeah, no, I mean, we, so we think about this a lot because so I'm I'm on the you know student hiring committee at at Pellier Roland, and we just went through the articling recruit, and this is the kind of the time of year where where this is I think fresh in our minds, um, and uh, I think so. I mean, there's 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 a bunch of different things that that we look for in in candidates, either as students or lawyers. Um, the things that we just talked about, you know, intellectual curiosity and, um, you know, a, a desire or a, um, a, a comfort level with being a generalist is certainly, you know, two of the more practical elements of it. Um, but I think, you know, we've, we've made a really um, concerted effort to make sure that we're also, um, you know, looking for candidates who bring a diversity of, of backgrounds and experiences to the firm. Um, and um, that, that's for lots of different reasons, but you know, a couple would be that um, we, you know, we, want, uh, we want our work and our workplace to be reflective of the society in which we, we find ourselves and in which we live. And, um, and also we, we believe that that kind of diversity of experience actually makes us much better as litigators because we have different perspectives to bring to bear on, on difficult problems. And um, that's no different, I think, than than um, the. I, th I think that's of a piece with the kind of um, uh, the appreciation for intellectual curiosity and, and and kind of a diversity of thought in in our in our office. So those are some other you, things that I think we select for. Wonderful, you articled at Lansner's. So you summered at Lansner's, you articled at Lansner's all the way back. I'm not suggesting oh, actually, that you're- I, I actually did an article at Lansner's. I um, Well, you did I an clerked. article at Lansner's. Oh, yeah. right. So talk about that. You clerked at the Court of Appeal. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's but right. Did you secure, did you secure your uh, position with Lansner's before you accepted the clerkship? No. How does no, it work? Explain. A... Sure. So. Um... So I, I kind of coming into law school, I had heard about this thing called clerking, and um, and I should say that you know this is not only was I new to Canada at that time, but I um, there are no lawyers in my family, and um, I had not uh, I was not particularly familiar with um, all of the kind of the different paths that you can take through uh, a career in the law, but um, this idea of clerking was one that that did seem to have some appeal to me. Um, and I, so I applied for that basically at the same time as I was applying for uh, summer positions. I think you, you apply in your, your second year. And, um, and so I, you know, I had told Lensners when I came in as a summer student that I would be, you know, clerking for my articles. And um, yeah, it was, uh, it's a bit of a leap of faith. I mean, there's, I think, I know that there's a bit of a debate with, um, uh, with <laughs> particularly with 2L and 3L students. Uh, who are currently looking at you know, their options in front of them, where the concern is, you know, if I don't, if I, if I leave my summer position without having secured an articling position, will that be there for me when I, you know, I'm done clerking? Like there's a, there's a real concern about that because there's, you know, there's certainty if you can lock it in as a summer student. Um, my thinking about it was, I really had two components. The, the first was that there's only one um, there's a very narrow band uh, where you can clerk in, at least in the current normative life cycle of a lawyer. And that's really in the, in the year or two after you graduate. And so I thought, you know, that's a, a limited time opportunity. I will, you know, I'd really like to do it and I can only do it now. And I think the other thing, which um, I don't want this to come off the wrong way because, but I think that this is something that, that lawyers and just people in general should um, should should bring to their you know their profession in their life, which is that you know what I, I'm going to bet on myself to be able to secure some sort of you know uh, position when I'm out of the clerkship. You know, and if um, I, I think you know, I was thinking sitting sitting there thinking at the time, you know, this is a valuable experience that I'm not going to get at any other at any other point, and you know, I. Um, I don't. I don't think I would necessarily want to work someplace that that doesn't value that kind of experience, especially that kind of you know direct advocacy experience, which I was looking for. 
and uh, and lenders was great about it. You know, they were you know they couldn't they weren't in a position I think because of law society rules to offer anybody jobs you know for the the following year. But you know it was you know I I kept in touch with my colleagues there. I was um, you know I, I was still you know very much you know kind of plugged into uh, my friends and colleagues at the firm and um, and it worked out. So you know. Uh, I would say that for for students who are concerned about not clerking because of the the, you know, the, the lack of certainty about what happens on the other side, I, I, I'm a small sample size, a sample size of one, but I I, I think that it's um, I, I would do it again, you know, every time. I think if I if I had the choice. So Lansners took you back, and you were with Lansners for about uh, uh, five years, right? Yeah, five years. Yeah. And uh, you even had an opportunity to be a co-counsel to Alan Lenzner at the Court <laughs> of Appeal in 2016. I, yes, I think uh, maybe, maybe other times as well, but certainly in 2016, I think, yeah. Well, that's at least what I could uh, find on Canley. <laughs> and, uh -oh, you uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, did some, I did some background research. Um, Alan Lesnar is a legend. I don't think there is any doubt about it. Tell us about working uh, with Alan Lesnar. What was it like? <laughs> it's a hoot. You know, he's, Alan is, um, you know, he's, we talk about intellectual curiosity. You know, I mean, he's, he's, um, he's very smart and he's, his mind is very, very quick. And he's able to, you know, like the best lawyers that you'll work with, you know, he, he has that, um, that sort of ineffable quality of being able to zero in on um, on on what's important in a case and to distill complicated issues down to um, uh, yeah down to down to a narrative that's digestible for the audience in front of you and um, yeah no he, he was he's terrific to work with. I'm looking at that case uh, that 2016 case. Uh, it must have been. Uh... Some case, one of the judge, one of the uh, uh, counsel uh, is a judge now, and yes. uh, you know, so it's it's a great it was a great company. Um, I looked at your other cases, and you worked with uh, other leading lawyers at your firm. Uh, did you get a lot of opportunities to work with uh, the most senior lawyers? Well, yeah, I sure, yeah. I mean, I, I have to say that. Throughout my career, I've been very lucky to have, um, you know, have, have lots of opportunities to work with um, th that category of people I referred to at the beginning of our conversation, which are, you know, people who are smarter than you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, I've been I've been very, very lucky to have those opportunities, whether they're at Lenzner's or at Pallier uh, and e even lawyers who are not at either of those firms, but who I found myself, you know, working alongside um, on other files where there's you know multiple parties, um, you know there's there's just lots. Of, th there have been lots of opportunities um, in the last decade to um, to learn from more senior members of the bar, and I've been frankly you know really impressed by how generous they've always been you know with me and with other you know folks who are who are more junior, um, and and that really informs I think the the way that I would like to practice, you know, that I, I, I hope to try to practice, you know, to the extent that I've been able to, um, you know, eke out any little insights or, you know, or tricks of the trade in the time that I've um, been practicing, I, you know, I, I try to be generous with that in terms of working with juniors uh, in mentorship relationships with people inside and outside of my firm, um, you know, taking time to speak to people who um, have you know, questions about the practice, whether they're, you know, pre-law or in law school or in, you know, at, at any stage of practice. And um, I really like that aspect of the, of the job, you know, that's, it's the collegiality, the civility, the sense of, um, uh, yeah, the, the sense of sort of shared purpose and, and desire to advance the profession, I think is, is, a, is one of the most lovely aspects of being a litigator. I know that you act fairly regularly for one of the health professions colleges. Um, I'm curious about your client profile. What uh, kinds of clients do, do you usually act for nowadays? Describe your practice. 
Yeah, that's that's a yeah good question because I think for me, you know, the beginning of my career, there was I did a lot of health law. I would say, you know, at its peak, probably fifty percent of my cases had some kind of health law component when I was um, at Lensner's. And as time has gone on, I've, I've I've kind of moved away from the professional regulatory work. And um, now I would say that you know the the main components of my practice are. Um, that's civil litigation involving um, you know, some sort of technology issue, um, commercial litigation that has, you know, that's of the, of, of the standard form that you would see on the commercial list. So shareholder disputes, contract disputes, um, that sort of thing. And, and I would say that the other third is more um, kind of heterogeneous because it, it encompasses a bunch of different um, a different bunch of different elements that that um, that have been consistent, but don't necessarily relate to one another. So, for example, I do a, done, a, a bunch of defamation work and and have done since since I started uh, practice. Part of that kind of came out of my interest in technology because people, um, you know, especially ten years ago, kept on saying, "Look, this person on the internet has defamed me, but I don't know who they are. What do I do about that?" And um, and I, you know, I could help talk them through or, or, or work them through this, the process, process of getting a Nora charter um, and, you know, finding out who the right party is for uh, the defamation lawsuit. Um, I do, uh, you know, a, a whole bunch of, of work for um, uh, smaller businesses and individuals as well. You know, in some cases it's, Again, it's it's pre litigation, and we're 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 dealing with um, something that's kind of a hybrid business dispute or potential litigation. I've been doing a lot of work over the last five years for um, private schools, you know, for schools that are dealing with, um, uh, in some cases, you know, tech, technology and cyberbullying issues. In other cases, um, you know, dealing with straight you know claims of negligence and and, and other issues like that, and. Uh, um, that's been really fascinating as well to help you know educational institutions um, navigate uh, whatever challenges are, are, are put in front of them. Do you have a habit of self-education of reading cases every once in a while? What is your daily routine looks like with respect to um, sort of competency hygiene, right? Keeping up <laughs> with competency. That's a good question. Um, so I would say that these days I, you know, I, I do a lot of CPD stuff either by teaching or by administering programs. And so that, you know, so for example, I just, uh, I guess two months ago finished doing the, the, the 12 minute civil litigator program chairing that co-chairing that with Cynthia Keel over at learners. Um, and that was a terrific program in part because I got to, um, you know, work with uh, members of the bench and bar on a dozen different topics and, you know, kind of uh, not only listen to what they were doing, but also help them develop the, the presentations they were doing and, and looking at their written materials. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Um, when I, when I am asked to do CPDs on other topics, you know, that's, that's a more targeted kind of of, um, of CPD, but you know, other than that, you know, I, I do, you know, I, I don't, I can't say that I read the ORs cover to cover whenever they come out, but it's, um, I, I keep keep abreast of the ORs. I, you know, I monitor law Twitter for, um, you know, important new cases that, that come out. And and also I, I lean a lot on my colleagues, you know, some of whom, you know, do a lot of that distillation and then will, you know, circulate internally um, important new decisions, which we then talk about in either via email in person or uh, through other means. Well, Ren, thank you so much. This has been uh, really interesting uh, in many ways, uh, both practical and theoretical. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate this interview. And uh, let's keep in touch. Maybe another interview, maybe just a coffee on Zoom. We got to do this. Sounds great. It's great to see you, Pulat. Thanks so much. Great to see you, Ren.